For centuries, human progress has been met with all kinds of obstacles as we push further out into wild places around the globe. Whether it's into the mountains or into the prairies of this vast country that is the United States, we're faced with some very serious issues about how man interacts and lives with the environment. This film aims to tell a story that's as old as time. It's a story about how we humans clash with the environment around us in the pursuit of progress. We're going to talk to experts in the fields of biology and ecology and people who are trusted with the protection and the management of wild species such as wolves and mountain lions and bears. We're also going to talk to those who lobby for hunting and ranching and recreational rights. And we're going to hear what their perspectives are. We're also going to talk to people in industry who are often on the front lines of the controversy dealing with the aftermath of policy that is made hundreds of miles away from their reality. Whether you're in a living room or a classroom, whether you're in the Western United States or another part of the world, the goal of this film is to generate conversation, to begin a new dialogue that brings us to more effective and better outcomes for everyone. If you look back and to the, you know what the Native Americans, you know how they regarded the ecosystem and the predators who ran around on it, they held them in high regard. When the Creator made the world, it was a perfect world, and everything worked together in order for the world to exist. The fish, the birds, all the other forms of life were here before man. And so they enjoyed what the Creator made for them. And they got along with the animals. And part of that equation was respecting predators. And so when man was created, we were put here as helpless beings. And so we came to rely on the animals because they were created first from one Creator and what impacts one of creation's children impacts the other children. We are such a small part of that history of this area. And we have very strong feelings in that short period of time. And the feelings that the First Nations, the Native Americans had that they gained in a very big period of time is something we should actually respect. At one time, wolves were all across North America. And then essentially, we removed them from all of the United States. It was a different time. We know a lot more now than we knew back then. You know, the government was actually paying bounties for people to kill wolves because the idea was we were settling the West. And as we brought cattle across with the European settlers, wolves were looked at as being competition. People were afraid of them. There definitely was a very focused effort to eradicate all the predators, not just wolves, but all the predators from the landscape. There was a giant movement to get rid of these animals. These bloodthirsty killing machines as neighbors is not a good idea. We as humans find this way to eliminate the things that we're afraid of, and sadly, the North American grizzly was one of them. Many of the big predators were hunted to near extinction, but it wasn't so much hunting, it was a, it was a it was a concerted effort to eliminate these predators from the landscape in order to reduce the, the depredation attacks on livestock. By the 1920s, I think the last wolf was killed in this area and there were no more wolf packs on the landscape here. And actually that happened throughout the United States. 
they killed bears, they killed cougars, they didn't completely eradicate them. And so those animals kind of rebounded on their own, whereas of course with wolves, they did reintroduce them to this area. It was mainly just human persecution and, and competition and fear that uh, extirpated them. Beaver were nearly trapped out in order to meet the demand for hats and various other fashion needs, I guess, for folks primarily in Europe and on the East Coast. Many of the waterfowl populations, for example, were wiped out for the sole purpose of creating designer hats. That came about as a result of the market hunting. There was a great demand for that sort of thing. There are more and more humans every day and less and less space for the wild animals to call home. We're sharing that space. We've kind of encroached upon their habitat and so now they are basically out there trying to make a living, trying to be, you know, like wildlife basically is. In forming the hundreds or even millions of acres of land to feed the people, we've destroyed habitat for animals. We modify the landscape. Agricultural habitats create lots of opportunities for predators and prey. These animals are adapting. They're evolving to that relationship, and people are a little, little behind. You study predators, it's not black and white. It's like humans. They're all individual personalities. Different interactions change the way they are and how they interact with certain animals. Bears and cougars and wolves are quite different in their foraging strategies. That is to say, how they gather their food. Cougars are ambush predators. They lay in ambush, they wait for the prey to come near them, or they stalk the prey and get close to the prey without being noticed that they are there, and then use a short burst of speed or possibly jump to the prey species to surprise it. Wolves are completely opposite of that. Wolves are actually cursory predators. So what they do is they make themselves wide open. They come out into a meadow and they announce literally to their prey species that wolves are here. We are here, notice us, look at us. They want to startle that herd. They want to run that herd. And by doing that, then they can choose the most vulnerable out of that population. Bears, they're opportunistic. Uh, they're really the epitome of opportunistic. They sort of meander along and they're smelling everything in their environment. A lot of times it's a surprise between both the bear and the humans that all of a sudden we're in close proximity to them. Predators require a large amount of territory in order for them to exist on the landscape. Simply because their prey, their food source, is much more scattered than, say, vegetation for the herbivores. As humans have encroached on their territory, their land space, predators are now sort of in a crunch to find enough prey, and that sometimes brings them close to humans. And that obviously turns into problems uh, for both humans and for the predators. And when you have areas of, of a lot of wilderness that butt right up against the city, you're going to have those animals coming inside the city limits. We're seeing more interactions. Here in Washington State, you look at all the beautiful country we have around here, and sometimes you feel like you're in the middle of nowhere, but one of us actually pulled up a residential layer one time and found out there's no place in Washington that you can be where you're more than 20 miles from a house. I don't think folks want wolf packs in urban areas. I don't think folks want grizzly bears in these areas either. Black bears, mountain lions. We remove light mountain lions all the time from downtown Boise. We just have to. Uh, bears getting into garbage cans, bears coming into gardens, because the space where they used to find food for themselves is now occupied by people. Cougars are definitely sighted more often we have more reports of death and damage uh, and interaction uh, in really in rural, residential, and urban areas. Our cougar population has more than doubled since 1994. And because of that, we see them showing up in southeast Portland. These are not, you know, new urban areas. These are existing urban areas for, for many generations. They're showing up in large urban centers largely because there's so many cougars in other areas of the state, they're a very territorial animal, 
that they're pushing the younger animals to find new territory where there aren't male dominant cougars right now. The reason that there's cougars now being killed around Portland is because of the people's problem. We're invading the cougar country. You look on the bounty records and it's going to tell you where these cougars are. There never was a cougar ever there. People's lived there for 100 years. Now the cougars come into the people because there's food there. There's dogs and cats and whatever. Once you get people integrated into it, there's no such thing as balance in nature because we provide an unbalanced food source for ourselves that they want to utilize. That's where the rub comes in. Of course, you've got to remember that the wild animals were here first. In regards to animals like coyotes, for quite a long time now, they've had a, an ability to basically adapt and become urbanized and survive in urban environments. And the reason they're doing that is because as human beings, we've we through our garbage and feeding pets outside and other attractants, we basically attracted them into these areas for an easy lunch. In regards to animals such as, say, cougars or black bears, oftentimes we inadvertently attract those animals by, say, feeding deer in our backyards with alfalfa, or putting salt blocks out, things like that. Once you have human development that's relatively high density, it's really difficult to have large predators or even large ungulates, elk for example, in people's backyards. They, they, they just don't do well. And houses are pushing out into wildlife habitat that was occupied by bears and cougars in particular. We are seeing more incidents of people and these carnivores coming across each other. We're fragmenting them. There's no continuous forest left uh, in, the, in the lower 48s, with a few pockets of exception uh, in Idaho and, and other parts of the Northwest. As we continue to fragment this ecosystem, that really disrupts the wildlife, um, not just predators, but, but all wildlife. But predators being the top of the food chain are uh, more susceptible to disturbances within their ecosystem. Ultimately, I think humans are thriving on the landscape and uh, pretty much all other wildlife is just surviving on the landscape at this point. We have to look at it in another way too, that what happens in nature is probably inevitably going to affect us as human beings. Whether we're aware of it or not, many of us come out of cultures of bias and prejudice that sometimes keep us from making wise decisions rooted in fact and in science. There are many myths that have been uh, perpetuated by apex predators based off of a lot of fairy tales that have come from, from like the Dark Ages, medieval times, that show predators in a, a very dark and a very evil light. They think that cougars are going to jump through their windows and eat them in their beds. They think that a grizzly bear is going to track them down and, you know, devour them. There is this thought that wolves will kill a cow every single day of the year, or that they are, you know, these vicious animals that lurk in, in the woods and they have to be killed and exterminated. Another myth that's common with wolves is that they will explode in population and unless we heavily kill them that we'll have them in our backyards eating our children. People have taken a little bit of information and then stretched it. Everything from uh, wolves carry all these diseases that are going to decimate humans as well as our pets and, and those kinds of things. Unfortunately those stories have continued on today and it's perpetuated by a lot of the media, a lot of films and movies and, and stories you hear about all the time. And it's unfortunately um, not based on the actual facts and the way the animals truly behave. The biggest myth when it comes to predators is the fact that we're on their menu. Because the truth is, they don't want to eat us. They're more afraid of us than we are of them. And you know, when you have that fear in your heart and that's the way you understand predators, it is one of those things like, why would you protect something you're afraid of? It's the very myth that really is the, the thorn that's causing this misunderstanding of them. Predators tend to invite controversy, and there is often information put out on both sides that is not accurate. Humans have an emotional response to carnivores. Either you love them or you hate them. We hear about them, it's because they've done something wrong. You know, they're on the front page of the paper, you know. Wolves kill 150 sheep. Grizzly bear mauls a hiker. You know, that's, that's our perception. They're big clowns. They're curious creatures. They're emotional. They have 
strong family bonds. They're not out there killing people. That's not what they do every time, every day. Not the big teddy bear, not the big killer, but somewhere in here. And that's important if we want to live with wild animals. But they're also resilient. You know, they did get driven into the mountains and went to the most remote places that we have on this continent. And those pockets of bears have, are what have blossomed back into what we know as the grizzly bear population today. I think that's why it gets emotional because it does kind of uh, permeate a person's being, if you will, when they feel so strong and so passionate about their values. So if you're an advocate for large carnivores or for wolves, then uh, you kind of see this as a battleground for uh, are we going to be successful at maintaining large carnivores on, the, on a broad landscape. But then if you're in the rural community and the rural way of life and being imposed upon by government and, and others who don't live and don't do what you do, um, and maybe don't understand what you do or don't support what you do, so then they're fighting for their way of life. And so I think that's where the emotion comes in. Every human that is involved with these wild animals, they do have a right to have what they need. It's just compromise. And you know, you do find that a lot of thought on either side sometimes is inaccurate. And it comes from ignorance. And you can't blame those people for being ignorant about wildlife issues. So that's why it's so important to educate both sides. And I really do believe if you give them that opportunity, people the, the gift of knowing and understanding, they will meet in the middle and there'll be respect. One of the reasons I think we're so polarized is we all have our own information channels. You figure out what you want to hear and you can reject the rest of it. We also live in a very political environment right now. We don't agree about predators, we don't agree about immigration or some of these other big issues. It just seems to, to carry in very strongly into the predator kind of world. Demographically, what you usually see is the people that tend to love the carnivores usually don't live near the carnivores. Whereas the people that are living near them, such as ranches and stuff, usually respect carnivores because they know it's hard to live on the landscape because that's how they live. Rightfully or wrongfully, we, a lot of times we blame the other side for, for the impacts. There are definitely things that we like to work together on, or, or uh, we wish we could, but because of barriers over those polarizations, we can't. And it's really quite sad because I think there's a lot of uh, common ground that can be reached to bring these two groups together. It's also uh, a misunderstanding from humans too, not understanding why the carnivores are there to begin with, what their role is in the environment. I think if people respect the opinions, even if they don't agree with them, that can help with the working together and trying to find some sort of middle ground that people can agree upon. Tradition among families is a very important part of culture, so that's difficult for us to break through. And I think at some point we just need to put our differences aside and look at, you know, we're just people here on this planet. We have extreme passions on one side or the other, but if we could look past that, and look at the person as, as an individual and then look at what's important for our future, I think we can come to a common ground and a common understanding. It's hard to say whether or not there can be harmony because then you're talking about deeply held beliefs by people. It's getting people to change beliefs that they hold very dear to them, that they feel very strongly about, is very difficult. We'll put together large working groups of people like the agriculture community, whether they're ranchers, farmers, loggers, along with urban, residential, conservationists, we put them all together and bring the science with us to try to find out all of the issues that are out there so that we can address them one by one. What's important is to bring people who are open-minded to these discussions. It takes a long time and it, it takes a lot of effort. It can be stressful, but ultimately, we have to find people that are willing to understand other people's viewpoints and then work together to try to figure out a solution. Because a person who comes in closed-minded who has no, no opinion but their own uh, is not going to be helpful. I think ecologists have always known that ecosystems are connected in various and multiple pathways. That's been out there. And, and there's been a lot of, lot of work showing energy flows bottom up. And so energy moves, let's say, from plants to prey to predators at the top. But at least for me, one of the interesting things of our research has been is that we're finding that ecosystems may also have this very important top-down structuring that takes place. 
species that seem to be doing this are these apex predators. They begin to affect everything below them. I shouldn't say everything, but they have huge impacts on what's happening in our ecosystems from the top down. When you remove or displace the apex predator, uh, the large herbivores, native large herbivores, elk or deer, essentially take over uh, herbivory. Browsing rates go up and woody plants uh, begin to go into major decline. This decline is followed where we have rivers and streams. We see bank erosion taking place. We see channel widening, high levels of erosion, and incredible impacts to rivers and streams. Each species of animal has their own order that they follow, and that order harmonizes with the life around it. There was a realization that eliminating predators from the landscape from an ecological standpoint has a very big impact. They've seen changes to the way that the rivers are working, changes to the plant life since the return of the wolves. If we were to remove predators from this planet, you would see a, a humongous imbalance in nature, which would create kind of a domino effect of things going out of whack and eventually things going extinct. Too many plants, too many animals that eat those plants, it would just go way out of whack and eventually it would come in and affect us in a very big way. And there have been some good documented studies showing, you know, if you increase prey populations, predator populations will also increase and then when prey populations fall, you'll get decreases in predator populations. It actually did a huge detriment to the prey species because then as you annihilate the predators, then the prey species become overpopulated, which creates overgrazing, and then that's when you have mass die-offs of the prey species um, because there's not enough food left anymore. When the apex predator disappeared, the ungulates began to browse more heavily throughout the system. And so those plants that they eat, and particularly the woody species that we can track over time, began to stop growing above browse level. If you're missing those key predators on a landscape, you'll end up with an exploding population of deer. But if you've got the full complement of predators on the landscape, they're pulling the sick and the weak out. And so that's keeping those herds strong. Having healthy riparian vegetation is incredibly important for having healthy fish habitat. Those plants provide shade, they provide bank stability, they provide cover. It's important for, for fish habitat. Grizzly bears are nature's can opener. And I've watched you know, animals like coyotes, ravens, eagles, literally wait for a bear to come to a carcass because they can't do anything with it. I've watched ravens lure bears in to these carcasses to open up the can. And when they open up the can, then everything eats. And when everything eats, then the whole ecosystem is, is happy. And that's just one little tiny example of the many ways a grizzly can contribute to other animals and other things that are in the ecosystem. The role of wolves, we think, is fundamentally important to these ecosystems because without them, the other predators don't seem to have the same kinds of effects. Bears are not effective at controlling elk populations. Cougar are not effective at controlling elk populations. But they're quite complicated. It's part of the food web. I would think that all predators play a role, it's just that we're finding that these apex predators have a significantly more important role in what happens out there. We're beginning to realize that predators are very essential to the ecosystem health. If we don't protect those areas, then the predator population is likely to collapse. I think that people are very tolerant of the big predator species. However, they want them to be managed. They want to limit the number of depredations, the number of conflicts that occur. Most people love wildlife. They love to get out in nature. They love to see deer. They love to see the predators when they're from a distance in Yellowstone, for example. The general public probably doesn't have a true understanding of what really is taking place. The general public looks at predators as kind of a vicious monster and inhumane in the way that they kill animals. If we were to stop every one of these predators from being inhumane, then I think we're, we're looking in the wrong area. We've lost focus, we've lost sight of what's truly important and what you know, we should be doing with our lives. Those opinions are influenced by how you grew up, you know, where you grew up, what's your experience with wild places. You know, do you come from a family of ranchers? Did you spend your entire life growing up in New York City where the largest animal might be a fox or a pigeon?
As human beings, we're incredibly out of sync with nature. And whenever that happens, I think there's a backlash. I think there, there's serious ecological problems. It's very important for us to live in concert with nature, not try to fight nature, not try to manage nature. Every time we try to manage nature, it, it usually backfires. Our mandate uh, from the legislature is to preserve, protect, and perpetuate wildlife, but then also to uh, maximize recreation, including hunting and fishing. It's regulated by agencies such as Idaho Fish and Game. It works because people know that there are animals there to harvest, but those numbers are limited. It's not an open season anymore. All of our wildlife species, predators and prey, are interrelated, and there's no question about that. You always hear people talk about individual species. And the biggest mistake that we could make is something that would drive any of our species to the point of extinction. There are very few absolutes, and uh, but when hunting is used as a way of controlling animals, we find that typically the prey species or the ungulate numbers are much higher because there's this encouragement to grow as many elk and deer as possible for hunters. We try to manage species in balance, and that includes predators and prey. In areas where we don't have many predators, we have prey species that get into trouble. It's not good for the predator, it's not good for the people that are making their living on the landscape. And so we have to try to manage to limit that occurrence from happening. When we can manage it properly, the level of animosity and the level of conflict drops. And that's good for people and it's good for the predators. The myth that we've been fed by wildlife management agencies, which are funded through hunting revenue is that we need to control wildlife populations or they'll just reproduce and they'll just be too many animals. What science has showed us in published peer-reviewed research is just the opposite, that predators like wolves and cougars and bears actually control their own population. We recognize that all of our wildlife species play a role in the community. Some of them, we, we would have no idea unless they were missing what the effects would be we're not going to take that chance. That really is the goal, is to manage all of our wildlife species so that they do not go extinct. We are dedicated to trying to optimize their numbers, not wipe them out. It is definitely working. The depredations have dropped, the elk herds are beginning to show signs of recovery, and the wolves are still very sustainable on the Idaho landscape and if something doesn't quite turn out the way we thought it would, then we, we can adjust. The end result is, is a good one. It's a positive result for wildlife in Idaho. We do it to continue a tradition, to feed our families, and to enjoy the outdoors and have a connection with Mother Nature that the individual hiker or camper doesn't have. Hunter dollars and angler dollars are the major funders of conservation in this country. Without the resource for future generations, our lifestyle disappears. So we have a vested interest in protecting the resource. One of the ways that we're managing wildlife right now, specifically wolves, is through hunting. And in several states across the nation, hunting is allowed on wolves. Wolves are a big game species in Idaho. Just like elk, just like deer, just like black bear, just like mountain lions. They are a big game species and we manage them as such. There is controversy surrounding the wolf hunt. There are people who feel that the wolf hunt is, they, they, you can't kill enough wolves, and there are people who feel that you shouldn't be killing any wolves. So just with anything surrounding this predator controversy, there are two sides to the issue. And I think the goal of the managers is to try to find the best middle ground that they have and do what's going to be best for the ecosystem in the surrounding area. You have to manage them in a pragmatic fashion, you really do. You gotta take action. In other areas where they're not having much of an impact, just let them go. Our hunters help us manage wolves. We probably sell 30, 35,000 wolf tags every year. Of those, maybe 300 actually harvest a wolf. And so can it be used to help you manage? I think so. Um, and I think we'll learn more about that. Just like we have other large carnivores, cougars and, and bears, we've gotten a lot more sophisticated, I would say, in terms of how we uh, use hunting to help us manage those species. It's probably not the most scientific way to do it. There's a lot of research that points that 
uh, when you hunt and you remove uh, the, like an alpha male or an alpha female from a pack and you disrupt the breeding pair basically, you are essentially allowing that entire pack to disband and become several different breeding pairs, which in turn creates more pups the next year and now you have more wolves on your hands. So by hunting them down that way, you're almost increasing the population. So it actually has a tendency to increase depredation on cattle and sheep. I think there'll be more and more science coming out about what really happens within the dynamics of, of a wolf family when there's heavy hunting involved. Some people believe that you have to hunt wolves in order to control their numbers. I would disagree with that and maybe science will tell us something different, but because they're so territorial, you'll start to see them self-regulate and manage their own numbers. Now there are people on the other side who want the recreation of being able to hunt a wolf. That doesn't fit within my personal values, it, it fits into their personal values. So that will be a public conversation. Wolves are part of the ecosystem. Eliminating them is not an option and it's not anything that we're going to advocate for. What we are going to advocate for is the management of wolves. Because they can, and have in other parts of the country, reduce the ungulate population to the point that sustainable harvest is no longer sufficient. They're going to keep coming and coming and coming. There's nothing endangered about a wolf. The population continues to disperse and and grow in the lower 48, this is going to be an issue that is not going to go away. Few people dispute that there is a crisis that faces human beings. The world is facing many challenges based on our behavior. There exists old and new solutions that need to be balanced by contemporary scientific fact. But one thing is certain. As humans, we can't afford to do nothing. Based on the current science available and political and social environments, there's one essential question that humans have got to ask. Are we capable of living with predators on the landscape? Predators do take cattle, they do take sheep, not just wolves, it's grizzlies, bears, and, it, and it's mountain lions or cougars up here in the northwest. Coyotes are, are one of the more prominent predators that take a lot of young calves and sheep. Just like with any other group, you can't generalize ranchers feel this way. It is up to the individual rancher. Have they experienced livestock issues? Have they not experienced livestock issues? What are their opinions and what are their backgrounds? The ODF&W Commission uh, had town hall meetings all over the state, knowing full and well that here in Wallowa County would probably be the first place in Oregon that would be affected by wolves. There were a number of concerns, mostly to do with depredations. There was enough history and people looking across other state lines, there were people that knew that there was going to be problems with wolves. If you was to take the old time ranchers, probably in western United States, they pretty much run their ranches off of the three S methods. They shoot, shovel, and shut up. If you had a problem out there, you shot it, you dug a hole, you got rid of the problem, you didn't have a problem anymore. And I'm sure some places that mentality still does exist. I have told the ranchers in this county that that don't work here because if you're gonna go out here and use the three S's when these wolves shows up, you're going to be in federal penitentiary. One of the issues with wolves that's different than other predators is if a cougar comes in here, she might slip in here, kill a calf, consume it, and you wouldn't be the wiser. A pack of wolves comes in here, they chase this entire herd. It doesn't affect just one animal. It, it affects the entire bunch. I think the livestock industry is coming around very rapidly. Uh, obviously they need to protect their, their uh, way of life, their business, and so they're finding their own ways uh, as well to, uh, to help prevent conflicts and deal with conflicts. We need to come to terms with how we're going to deal with wolves. And when wolves become depredators of livestock, they need to be lethally destroyed. And, and that's a tough thing for a lot of people to consume but that's the way that it's been successful in other places and that's the way that it's going to have to be here. There's nothing endangered about a wolf. 60,000 of them 
in uh, Canada and Alaska, the population continues to disperse and grow in the lower 48. This is going to be an issue that is not going to go away. We're going to have to come to terms with these are lethal animals and they need to be lethally removed from time to time. If there's irrefutable evidence that those animals that are called predators are impacting ranchers' livestock, create a fund to pay for their losses. But I don't think that today with people on almost every foot of the earth, it's going to be hard to separate nature from man. We never raise these animals to be depredated on. If wolves are going to be here, we're going to have losses. We need compensation, but it still doesn't make it acceptable for an animal to kill one of ours. Maybe they lose one or two cattle to what they term predators, then maybe the government should give them a subsidy too for their losses. It's nothing but sucker bait. We are going to pay you for the damages if you can give me a picture of a wolf actually cutting and wrapping these steak. And so they will pay you damages for a little while until these wolves get to the magnitude where nobody can afford to pay for the damages, then it will all dry up and go away. And the people, the livestock community again, will be the ones saddled with all the problems and the cost of it. That's where it's headed. You can mark my words on that one. Certainly we cannot all be so greedy that money is the only thing we see when it comes to deciding who lives and who dies because every form of life has a right to be on this world, otherwise they wouldn't have been created. As we continue to evolve and science continues to change and we come up with, there's new research, there are new things being revealed, we can change the way that we manage. And there are a lot of different groups trying to come up with new and creative ways to have anti-depredation for livestock owners and trying to work with them to come up with new ways. Okay, let's try this. Uh, let's try this electric fencing. Let's try having guard llamas out with the livestock or guard dogs and see if this is more effective. So there are people doing that right now. And as that research comes to light, it can change the way that policy is done and the way that, that people coexist with predators on the landscape. Also the use of what's called fladry, which is like this stripping that waves in the wind, kind of like you'd see at a used car dealership or putting that shiny flattery on electric wire, those can definitely be effective. There have been people using things called howl boxes where they play recorded wolf howls to sort of try to convince wolves in the area that there's already wolves here having guard llamas out. It all works for a little while and then they just get used to it and then they come right in light with the propane cannons and go back to doing what they're doing. Most important thing is human presence. If you're ranching sheep or cattle, you've got to invest time into doing it. And that will also oftentimes mean investing in a guard dog or several guard dogs or a guard llama. And during birthing seasons, just using common sense. I hear of wolf-friendly beef and, and uh, I've heard some environmental say, you know, well, you know, everybody says, that they're willing to pay a few more dollars for wolf-friendly beef and that sort of thing. I say, show me the money. Predator-friendly um, programs are um, a, a new and exciting way of mostly private corporations and small businesses mostly that are finding a way to promote safe practices within agriculture safe to predators by passing along that cost of what it takes to raise animals in a predator-friendly scenario. The consumers have a direct effect on being able to promote predator-friendly agriculture. Trap and relocation is often a death sentence to the wildlife. It depends on the species, but a lot of them die when they're taken out of their home and taken somewhere else. It's an ugly truth, and it's not a satisfactory solution in many cases. We have to be aware of the many factors that affect their habitat, and we can't just say we're going to put them out in this area and try to retransplant them if we don't know if the ecosystem that we're transplanting them into 
is able to be conducive to their survival to be transplanted into that area. The public, they will listen, especially if they know that the wildlife that's causing them conflicts is going to die if we have to really deal with it. It depends on the species, but there's always some sort of solution, and a lot of people have reoccurring problems. Sometimes lethal solution is not the easy solution. If there's a way to permanently end the solution that's non-lethal, that is absolutely the way to go. I think we're at a very interesting point in time. And I think what happens over the next several years will really determine that. I think it'll be a shame if we brought back wolves again to repeat the mistakes from the past. And that's certainly what's happened in Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. Whether it's, you know, people who believe that humans first, we don't care if we want, you know, there's animals gonna exist, or I love animals so much, I'm gonna do everything I can to keep them around. The two similarities in both of those things are they're about them, not about the animals, usually. You know, and that's, that's bad. If people just learn to tolerate large megafauna predators and learn to not manage them according to our interests alone, if we change that attitude and realize that just let predators go to do what they need to do, then I think that's the beginning of us coexisting with them. And that's, that's my hope, is to coexist with large predators. Not to praise them, not to put them on pedestals, but to simply live in harmony with them. And I think that's the goal that humans should have with all species. There can certainly be harmony between humans and predators. We've lived in, alongside predators for thousands and thousands of years. We're still in existence today, and predators are still in existence today, so one hasn't killed the other off, so it's definitely possible. I don't think I think much about nature being balanced. Nature is in constant flux. No matter what changes you see, systems will go on. They don't always go on in ways that humans like. At some point, there will be boundaries or edges in the landscape where we say, enough is enough, and I understand that's a concept. But where we will allow wolves to live, we still have the question of how we will manage those. Will we provide protections to them or will we make them just open season for anybody that wants to shoot a wolf? I would like to believe that there can be harmony between humans and wild predators. I think we have a long way to go to get there yet and a lot of it is based on educating the humans about the necessities of carnivores, to educate humans about the absolute imperative notion of biodiversity continuing on this planet. I'm an opportunistic person and I'd like to believe that harmony can be reached, but drastic changes need to happen quickly in order for us to get to that point. A world without predators is a, it's not one that I'd want to be a part of. There's a reason we name our baseball teams and our football teams after these animals. It's because they personify power and will and tenacity. They're a good representation of what we should, of the wild, and the wild that we should keep here in North America and throughout the world. If the world was without apex predators, nature would go away. It would be a one giant city, that's it. But then it would be only a matter of time before everything failed. We would see the end of it all. The greatest predator to man is the lack of predators. It would consume us and we'd be done. We would not have anything that controls any of the, their prey species. Prey species would go crazy in their numbers, which would in turn create this world into an, a, pretty much a disaster and a mess. Ultimately, the, the beginning of the extinction of the large predators begins a very slippery slope that eventually will end up in us succumbing to the same thing that they did. The wonderful thing and the scary thing about nature is, is that it doesn't happen overnight and it doesn't happen in a decade sometimes. Sometimes it happens in a hundred years. In an experiment, 
you can do something, but you may not see the results in your lifetime. And to make a quick decision about what results you're seeing in that short period of time is foolish and doesn't jive with nature and the rhythms of nature. So whether we are doing the right thing or not, I don't know. There is good evidence that humans can cause population declines in wildlife, and there's also good evidence that we can assist in recovery of wildlife. You know, as an individual, that makes me feel pretty good. We can change our behavior. We have the mental capacity to change how we react and to change uh, how we feel. The animals can't really change their behavior. It's very instinctive. So it is up to people to change the way that we behave and that we choose to interact with those animals. I've seen about all the change that I can absorb. I've seen it change to where I'm about full up on change. I'm more of a traditionalist. I like things the way they were, and I don't like where it's going. So, end of story. We have so much to learn. And I think part of that great experiment is realizing that we have a lot to learn yet. And that we should keep our mind open to change. We should keep our mind open to results when we see something positive. But remember that, you know, one thing that's true about nature, it's unpredictable. You know, it's dynamic, it's complicated. It's this machine that you can't learn. You will never be able to understand completely. And just being humble enough to to realize that is part of the part of the what we need to do. And there's steps in the right direction. Whether it's honed in yet, no way. We have so much to learn. And to think that you understand and think that you have the ability to really change everything is very egotistical. I mean, you are. You're, this is one of the most arrogant things you can say because, yeah, we as humans can affect wildlife but we're not gonna do something that's going to change it. In fact, if anything's ever gonna happen, nature's gonna come back and get rid of us. When you destroy an ecosystem, it's not gonna rebound overnight. If we destroy it in the 200 years that man has come from the east into our country, it's not gonna rebound overnight, no matter how much man helps it. But what we do have, we need to protect. You can't make mistakes again. So what we have now is a knowledge of the mistakes that we've made and what we have in nature. And we have to consider all those. And that's, that's the only choice we have. And it's that great experiment that we are living in, humans playing with nature, that may come out beneficial for both or may destroy it all. But we got to realize and take the responsibility that, that either of those outcomes can happen. I can do research to perhaps tell you what the value of having wolves might be in an ecosystem, but it's up to you as an individual to decide whether that's worth it to you to have them around. And at some level, some people will say no, and at some level, some people will say yes. And we will somehow work that out over time. So where do we go from here? We know that humans are not only capable of, but we're essential in solving some of the most complex of problems. Through vigilant scientific research and expanded and comprehensive educational outreach, we can work toward better solutions that answer some of these complex problems, not only for today, but for our future.